Okay, I think we're live. <laughs> yeah, I got a notification. I think we're live. Okay, so for anyone that joins, we start right at 12 Central Standard Time. It looks like we got one person on. We'll get some more on here. Um, I did put this also on my LinkedIn, so hopefully there's a new group of uh, ladies that I've been speaking with to get this uh, together and have them come. And if anyone is jumping on in the beginning of the presentation, um, I'm not going to launch the presentation just yet. We have about 10 minutes or so that we kind of delegate to networking. And so if you have any deals that you want to pitch, um, there is a button where you go to, it looks like it's now participants where it's like a little head and then you can click um, raise hand if you want to talk about a deal that you have uh, or maybe something that you're looking for. This is a great place to share those things. Um, let's see. And that way we can, we can help each other to, you know, close what we, we have and provide each other, you know, leads, money, assistance, knowledge, whatever it is that you need. So I'll kind of leave it to y'all and see if anyone has anything. While we wait for some people to get on. And also you can also type in the chat box too, if, if you don't wanna raise your hand and um, turn on your sound. Got my chat up. All right, I'm looking for any raised hands or any comments or any questions or any deals. Um, I'm here in Dallas. We've got Becky in Houston and her and I will both be presenting today. She is with Real Estate IQ and I'm with myself. <laughs> um, so yeah, the weather's nice outside today. Hopefully everybody's doing really well this morning. Um, for me, there's been kind of a lot of uh, changes that have happened uh, I don't know if anyone out there, you know, has a business and they've applied for the Paycheck Protection Plan program, sorry, or um, or the SBA loan or any of that kind of stuff. If you've had success, I did uh, have some good success with that. So now that's that's rolling in. Uh, let's see. We, uh, we've got someone looking for something cool, looking for four to nine multifamily deals around Dallas. Uh, are you looking for four to nine units? Uh, or are you looking for um, four to nine different deals? Because that's <laughs> that's a lot of difference. If you could clarify, you know, okay, okay, good. I was gonna say, holy crap, <laughs> that could, could be like 250 per, you know, anyway. Um, yeah, so if anyone out there that's listening right now, if you are in the space of multifamily, two to, uh, four to nine units, really five, nine units, uh, and you have a deal or if you own something, and you're looking to to make a sale um, we've got someone looking for that exact size multifamily i don't have any otherwise i'd help you the only thing i've got right now if anyone is interested in i haven't decided if i'm going to syndicate this yet um, but i do have a friend who has it's he's it's not listed because it's essentially a commercial deal it's three houses in um what do, we, what do we call it? University Park, um, or Highland Park in, in Dallas. And for anyone that's not in Dallas, that's the pretty much wealthiest area of, of Dallas. And it's like its own city. It's got its own rules, laws, school district, everything. It's it's in Dallas, but it's not Dallas. So um, it, it's, it's very nice. And there are three homes that the guy's wanting to sell them for too much, um, but you know, I could make a reasonable offer. And I thought about, you know, well, what I'll do is put up 100K or so and the uh, the cool thing about the three houses is that they already have property management that goes with it, uh, and that comes with it at the sale. Uh, and then they were um, making net uh, twenty percent return on investment during COVID. So if anybody is interested in that, that's something I would want to partner on for sure. Uh, I guess the next thing for me to do in the next week, if someone doesn't want to partner on it with me, um, then what I'll do is I'll go ahead and put down the earnest money and go syndicate it. So. I thought I would just put it out there, you know, if anyone's looking for, it's not multifamily, but it is, um, it's commercial, so it's valued the same. So that's why I was saying the guy definitely wants too much. He's kind of out of touch when it comes to the the cap rates in Dallas, um, because when you're buying commercial five plus units, it's based on the income. So you, you want to look at 
net operating income um, and base the cap rate on the infill cap rate of the city. So right now Dallas is like worst case, like a five cap. Um, some people are trying to trend downwards, but that's not happening right now. So let's, let's be real. Um, so yeah, if anyone's interested in that, that's what I got. Anybody else have any deals they're looking for or any deals that you have? Um, I've got a girlfriend looking for mobile home parks. And so I, I put it out there to the universe. And so if you're looking for a mobile home park, there's three and she's not going to close on all of them. She's got a 1031 exchange. Uh, most likely she won't close on all of them, but um, probably one. So if anyone's interested in mobile home parks, there's, uh, well, there's an RV park and then two mobile home parks that um, I've got friends that don't, uh, don't want to hang on to them anymore. So it's direct to direct to seller if that, if that helps anyone. And then I'll give you guys the floor for the next five minutes or so to get anything off your chest. If you want to share deals, if you want to network, you know, tell us about the weather where you're at, whatever it's, it's your time. As it usually takes people about 10 minutes to get logged in. And like I was mentioning before that zoom just did an update, I think this last week. So I've been actually having a hard time. My computer does an auto update. So two days ago, I finally was like, okay, I'm gonna spend the time to update it. But if that, if you have to update it, you're most likely gonna be like 10 minutes or, or longer, you know, late to the, the start time. So that's, that's cool though. Let's see. All right, there's three more people that, are y'all are looking for anything? Do you, do you looking for any certain leads? Do you, um, do you have any any deals or anything like that? Please feel free to share. Nada. Okay. Okay. Sounds like y'all need to get hooked up with real estate IQ software. Because <laughs> if you're looking for leads, that's a great place to source them from instead of having to, like I've done some skip tracing where I go find someone and hire them and whatever, they have all those services inside the software or inside real estate IQ. So make sure my sound's up. Not off, up. Okay, cool. Yes, that's the only thing I've got right now to share as far as what I am looking for slash have. Um, I'm, you know, still looking for uh, large multifamily units, but right now it's um, it's definitely a weird time. Um, found one good one, but people are kind of pulling back for a minute and saying, well, maybe I don't have to sell. So, or maybe I don't want to sell because they know that they're going to have to take a price haircut right now. <laughs> Uh, one cool trick, and so one thing that I'm going to probably forget to mention in this presentation, this is about negotiating. Uh, commercial real estate, if, if y'all don't know, is like super unique. So as far as being able to uh, negotiate, it's a really key skill because when you're negotiating a purchase and sale agreement or just a letter of intent, you have to be really creative and um, finding problems and creating solutions and being creative is like super key. Okay, I got some. Uh, what are the cap rates you are seeing out there in Dallas? Um, like I said, Dallas, I'd say worst case five cap. Um, there are some people that were trying to trend downwards towards like a high four or something like that. But again, that was uh, pre-COVID. Um, so during that time, it was like, okay, this bull, bull run market cycle is never going to end. Let's go ahead and keep compressing those cap rates. So um, in, in that's like in the city, you know what I mean? Like high rises and really high, nice luxury, um, amenities. We have a, a building in Dallas that has its own spa in it. Um, it's like a Vegas style, <laughs> like apartment building. So anyway, uh, I'd say worst case five cap, but, uh, five cap for C, believe it or not. Yeah. And that's what was crazy. Actually, I just went running this morning. There's a complex right by my house that I got a email from a broker about it in February. And I'm like, oh my God, I know where that is. I run by that every day. And I've been curious to see who owns it and, and buy it. It's the perfect uh, place deal, et cetera. And um, they wanted to sell it at like hundred K a door. Uh, comparing it of course to like you cross over Northwest Highway and on the other side. Yeah, it's an A-class brand new build by um, Aura, A-U-R-A. Um, 
totally different deal. So, so they're like, oh, well, we can compare, you know, that's, that's, that's a five cap. I'm like, well, it doesn't mean that a C should be at a five cap. So anyway, but they still try to sell it at that. So right now, um, what's on the market, they need to sell it. So let me go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, and if you have any more questions or any more comments or deals or looking for anything, feel free to pop in the webinar chat at any time. And then I'll get back to those uh, when we finish up. I'm really sad today is the last, the last one of our seven series. Um, how to, here, let me get out of the chat and then I'll launch this. Bam. And see if it'll load. It's our last week. Seven out of seven, it doesn't take millions to be a queen. The Apartment Queen's Guide for Successful Single and Multifamily Real Estate Investing. So I've obviously focused a lot on multifamily because that's that's what I know, but um, it doesn't matter. Like today's topic we're going to be covering is week seven, negotiation success. So negotiation is negotiation, honestly. Like this book right here, I've got someone in my life that doesn't understand negotiation and makes everything difficult. Um, it's called Getting More. Um, that, that was my starting point of learning how to negotiate, uh, along with some body language books. And then I'm pretty much summarizing two other books that I've read that have been super key, but it doesn't matter if it's even in real estate period. Like you can negotiate your way onto a first class seat on a flight if that's full, you know what I mean? Um, so what we'll cover is negotiation success. Uh, and then we did our welcome and networking. Um, we'll do uh, who is real estate IQ and then we'll do a Q and A at the end. So again, if you have questions, pop them in there when you feel like it. If you're new to Zoom, uh, we're going to cover a few quick things. Again, you can chat at any time, and I'll come back and answer the chat at the end. Uh, I kind of covered earlier how we can raise the hand, and so then I know someone needs to speak either uh, then or at the end of the presentation. And then we have a Q&A and also a poll. So a poll kind of looks like this. And if you check out all the polls, see there's one that just popped up for us. Um, so this is something that if you guys answer all of the polls, you're going to be entered in for a raffle for some free stuff. Who doesn't like free stuff? I like free stuff. Uh, and it's good free stuff too. So if you're a real estate investor, which is what I'm assuming most of the people that are here are, uh, th those are going to be some tools that are going to help you in your career. So if you'll just answer all of those uh, poll questions, you'll be answer or entered at the end of the presentation uh, for your free prize. So, like I mentioned, we have a raffle and just make sure that, again, that you are going through every poll and answering all of them. Uh, Real Estate IQ, number one in deal finding, 45,000 leads every month. So, they're bound to help you to increase uh, your pipeline, which is exactly how you scale a business. So, if you're to the point, regardless of if it's single, multi, commercial, whatever, um, they have leads for all kinds of uh, different properties. And we'll cover that at the end a little bit more in detail. So, I'm going to play a little testimonial. Hey guys, I'm here with Adam at Redneck Country Club at the Jet Lending event and Adam has been using our system for a while. Adam, could you share with us your experience with our tool? Yeah, so um, I love the tool. It was re it's really been very useful for me as, uh, as a new investor. Um, I don't have access to the MLS, so running comps was something that was a problem. Um, now that I have that the tool, I can run comps. It allowed me to secure my first deal, um, and I'm going to market with it and look to, um, because of the comps that I was able to run and get it for the right price, I was able to secure a deal that's probably going to profit me somewhere north of $50,000. Oh, fantastic. And by the way, we uh, can also help you market your deal too, Adam. Uh, thank you so much. And guys, our deal analysis suite is only $15 a month, and it's with unlimited comps all over Texas. So make sure you take advantage of this special right now. Thank you, guys. So that is our testimonial. Awesome. And again, we'll cover in more detail at the end. Uh, about exactly what you can get. So this is how I'm gonna start, and I have every single week uh, an icebreaker. What is my why? Uh, because for me and my business, that's really why I do what I do. You know, a lot of people uh, that get into real estate, uh, they do it for the money, um, and maybe they don't do it for other reasons. But for me, yeah, money's great, cool. Um, but at the same time, um, it's really important to me to put together my why, which I'll get to my why. It is, basically creating independence for other people. And I focus heavily on women because uh, I'll cover later a little bit more about the psychology of 
of why women kind of need a little bit of a push sometimes. Um, we don't ask. Um, we just assume a lot of things uh, in the way that we're brought up. I won't go into super detail today, um, but you know, women have uh, difficulty because of our our entire upbringing and generations and generations of information that we have. So uh, it is it is my pleasure to be able to produce passive cash flow and cash flow period, which has created independence for me. So I want to help other individuals, especially women, do that for themselves um, so they can have complete independence and, and be who they are and pursue the life they really want. So that's that's my why. And then here's me, uh, Kaylee McMahon. Oh, there we go. We've got a quick poll. So again, remember guys and gals, if you are on here and you want to enter or if you want a raffle, or if you want part of the raffle to enter for a free prize, uh, just go ahead and fill this out real quick, both questions. Make sure to get all of them in and you'll be entered for the prize. And I can't vote, it stinks. <laughs> okay, so here's me, Kaylee McMahon, uh, the founder of The Apartment Queen. Uh, we have 731 doors, assets under management currently right now as key principal or general partner. And like I mentioned earlier, I have a passion for helping others to create independence. That is, that is my driving thing that gets my butt out of bed every day. All right, so we're gonna start with four shocking facts before we get into the negotiation tactics and exactly what it's gonna take. So, negotiating is uncomfortable to 90% of humans. If you're uncomfortable with negotiating, it's not just you. There's a lot of other people out there who are uncomfortable. That's why I said humans. <laughs> Most people can't listen. That's another shocking fact, which is actually the cheapest concession that you could ever have in a negotiation. If you could listen to the other party actively, which is such a hard skill, you actually can sometimes, or most of the time, instead of costing you more money, because sometimes that's the bottom line, uh, you can actually make other concessions by just listening and letting the person really get to their, their true needs. Uh, old school ways of intimidation do not work. Sorry, bonding does. So I've experienced this myself in multifamily in negotiating with a broker on price, et cetera. And you know, he was younger, which was surprising. So he tried to uh, use old school tactics of you know calling me names and intimidating me, uh, like you know, as if this this isn't going to happen and you're going to fall out of contract and all this stuff. And I'm like, whatever, it doesn't affect me. So, but if he were to instead bond with me and try to understand uh, what I needed, I would have been more likely to concede. Um, no is not negative. So there's a book called Getting to Yes, and we're not going to cover that in this book, but basically we're going to talk about the no. So getting to yes is trying to get, it's a system actually the FBI used to use, getting your counterpart to get to yes. But actually where I'm going to cover is no is actually your optimal word. No is not the end. It's actually the opportunity uh, to get the other party to clarify what they really want. So you kind of have to think backwards a little bit. Um, we're going to be, this is going to be a little verbose. Um, so again, if y'all want the slides, uh, please ask for them at the end. Um, or, you know, admin at the apartmentqueen.com. I'm happy to, uh, to get them to you. And then also, uh, we have a real estate IQ group of apartment investors, and we'll also have this in there, uh, if you request it. So, um, here we go. All right. So starting off with negotiations, like I mentioned earlier, new rules are what we need to think about. People want to be understood and accepted. No matter what negative things they're saying, no matter what behaviors they're displaying, uh, listening, like I mentioned earlier, is the cheapest yet most effective concession that we can do or use to get there. Uh, by listening intensely, you demonstrate empathy and you show sincere desire to better understand what the other side is experiencing. And even if you don't care, if you can just demonstrate this, you will get so far. Um, so we're going to start with some new rules. So how do you do that? How? Active listening, like I mentioned earlier. So as the active listener, you can't come into a negotiation with your hypothesis on exactly what the other person wants. You need to have several hypotheses and be flexible because you're going to get surprises. You need to be ready for surprises. The best negotiators are the ones that, like I said, have several different hypotheses and then they use the other party's shared information to narrow down exactly where they need to, to, to target or to focus on. So it's going to always be in flex or flow while you're negotiating. Um, Negotiation, again, is not an act of battle. It's discovery. That's as, as simple as it is. So, for example, I, I negotiate with people all the time and they hate me for it, which is just kind of mind blowing. But it's just because they're so uncomfortable doing it on their end. And it's literally just about discovering the information that you need to make a decision, whether it's you or the other party making the decision. Um, you need to quiet the voices in your head and make your encompassing focus to basically focus on what the other person has to say. 
Um, your goal is to identify your counterpart's needs uh, and make them feel safe. Make them feel safe to talk about what they want. Uh, negotiation begins with listening, making it about the other party. Again, this is key, validating their emotions. So even you can say out loud, uh, and we'll come into labels next, but you'll say out loud the emotions that you see and you're validating that they're, they're, they're that you understand that they have those emotions. Um, and when you go through an, eth an ethos appeal or an emotional appeal, emotions actually will um, control somebody's behaviors way more than, than facts will or money will and, so, and other things. So that's kind of a non-material or non-monetary thing that controls um, negotiations is emotions. Um, so you need to, like I said, create enough trust and safety for a real conversation to begin. Again, going too fast is one of the worst mistakes that all negotiators make. I've done it before, for sure. Being in a hurry, um, people will feel as they're not being heard, and you risk undermining the rapport and trust that you built. So, um, for example, I don't know if I go into this later, but I'll tell you that there's so many different ways that you can do this to slow down. Um, if you feel like you feel pressure to hurry up, give them an answer, they're gaslighting you, whatever it is, I always like take the initiative to slow it down. So when it's in a commercial negotiation, like I mentioned before earlier, that like the contract, you can structure it whatever way you want to. Uh, there's no standard track forms. There's no standard way to negotiate. There's no standard um, option fee. There's no, it, everything is, is just creative to meet everyone's needs. So negotiating is key. Well, so if I wanted to slow it down, how I do that is you can go to the bathroom, you can get something to eat, um, you can take a break. So meaning like if something's getting too heated, I always will tell a broker, for example, because I know you negotiate with them the most or a seller, you know what, I need to sleep on it. I'll get back to you tomorrow. I will send you an email. Or if it's the weekend, it's even better because then you can take like two days and say, well, I'll get back to you on Monday. You know, no one's going to die if you, if you make them wait. So active listening is so key to the first step to a negotiation. You have to get the other person, the other party to open up. Um, and then when you get to talk, your time to talk is going to be mirroring and labeling. So the next step is mirroring uh, when it comes to you talking. Now, there are three effective voices when you are speaking as a negotiator. Uh, there's the late night FM DJ voice. And what it does is you can use it to selectively make a point. You inflect your voice downwards and you keep it calm and slow. When that's done properly, what that gives the other party is a feeling of your authority and trustworthiness really interesting and it doesn't trigger defensiveness. So I'll always do that. Like my voice right now is very much the second voice, the, the positive playful voice, because I want to keep you interested. I want to keep you listening. But the thing is in a negotiation, a positive playful voice will actually, uh, depending on when you're using it in the negotiation, will usually elicit a response from the other side. So think if I'm talking like this, there you don't want to say anything back, but if I'm having a playful voice and I'm really excited about what I'm talking about, that really usually makes someone want to interject or speak. Uh, and, and what you want to do is you've let the person on the other end speak so much that now when you finally get your turn, you need to do it correctly and it should be your, you get the floor. Um, you also have the ability to use the direct or assertive voice. Now, that is not appropriate when you're in the beginning stages of negotiation. You want to get from listening to mirroring uh, to labeling, and then whenever you're past labeling and you're into maybe a haggle, we'll cover that later, uh, the assertive voice is good to say things where if they offer something and they won't stop um, to think about another solution, we don't do that. Like something just very assertive. Um, and it's, you know, not name calling, not yelling, nothing like that. But in, if you use that in the beginning, you're not going to get anywhere and it may actually turn on you. Um, putting a smile on your face, like I mentioned. So we start with active listening and rapport building and then mirroring. Mirroring, there's like the physical version of mirroring where you're actually mirroring the person's body behavior or body language. So if the person across from you puts their hand out, you put your hand out. If they're sitting like this, you're sitting like this. If So you're basically copying what they do, not every single thing they do, but in general and very slowly, you're just kind of doing it. And actually, if the conversation is going well, your body will just do it um, automatically. You don't even notice it. But if it's not going well and you want to control the situation, the, um, the way to do it um, automatically is, again, mirror their behavior. So mirroring, when it comes to speaking, though, um, you can do it with body language first with putting a smile on your face. Whenever you start with a smile on your face, even if it's uncomfortable, uh, it will put the other party in a, a positive frame of mind. Um, and actually, they will be able to think 
quickly and are most likely to collaborate and problem solve on their own accord. Um, and positivity creates mental agility for both people. Whenever there's negativity, uh, usually people want to tap out. Um, now, again, you can, you can be very direct and to the point as long as you create safety by the tone of voice that says, I'm okay, you're okay, let's figure things out. And I say things like that all the time. Um, view assumptions as a hypothesis and use your negotiation, these, these processes to test your hypotheses. So you're, you're now talking, you've got your three tones of voice. Mirrors are the next thing that work magic. Mirrors are you're repeating the three words or the critical three words that someone has just said. Why? Why? Because if you're in a negotiation and you continue to say something that's different than what the other person said, what is different in the human brain? Actually, we are drawn to what is similar and drawn away or have fear of what is different. So uh, if you continue to in, uh, insinuate similarity, uh, that, that facilitates like false bonding, basically, but it feels like bonding to the other party. Um, by repeating back what they say, your counterpart will inevitably elaborate. And so it's really funny. Uh, like, for example, I'll give you a, 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 an example right here. So uh, if somebody said, um, if somebody said they're, they're confronting you and they say, I think you're wrong about the sky being blue. You're like, the sky being blue? And what's interesting is, I don't know what that just did to your head, but what it does do is it makes the other party think, yeah, that's what I said, but they're not gonna say that. What they'll do is they'll, they'll re-clarify um, what they said. So they'll say, well, the sky, you know, is is blue, but not every day. But you know, like they'll they'll, they'll kind of scramble to to reevaluate what they said because essentially mirroring makes the person feel like uh, you're similar to them, but also it's like a it's a question mark at the end. Um, so you'll say the late night DJ voice, "I'm sorry, the sky is blue," and you'll say it with a question mark. So again, they feel the propensity and the need to reclassify and reclarify what they're saying. So basically, if you're going to keep repeating that with every new thing that they say, what you're going to do is you're going to lead them in the direction of where your hypothesis is going or lead them in the direction of like a calm solution and not blaming and because they're going to feel connected to you, bonded and similar. So mirrors are, are magic. It's, it's, it's really weird and it's really uncomfortable at first, but it's great to practice. Like if you're watching Telemundo, or if, you're, if you're watching someone else speak and you wanna practice, I'm gonna practice it on someone tonight. Um, then, like I mentioned, labeling. Labeling, again, is another thing that that's your next stage. So you're, you're similar, you're, you're listening, you're similar, and now you're to labeling. And so this is your opportunity, again, to speak. But when you're speaking um, about labels, this is basically taking the negative emotion that you kind of already think you know, whether you're right or whether you're wrong, it doesn't matter. So for example, if the other party, for example, is accusing you of something and they probably already did, um, and then maybe you know that there is, there's always an underlying emotion to what they're, they're accusing you of. For example, uh, you, you might have a grumpy grandpa at a birthday party and where actually the, the real underlying emotion that he's feeling is the fact that he's alone. And because he's alone, he creates on the surface that he looks grumpy. So you want to label the emotion that is below the surface reaction that you're seeing. So labeling, and then you're going to do it in a sense like this, where it's, uh, you're saying it out loud. So, you know, um, it seems like in this situation, it seems like, or sounds like, or looks like you're lonely. And, uh, that basically what that does is labeling it out loud. And because it's out loud, um, somebody, when it's said out loud, sometimes thinks, uh, that it's, it's ridiculous or that it's too much, or sometimes you're spot on, but regardless, if they pull back, uh, and say that that's not it. And you're saying, well, I didn't say it was that. It just seems like that, you know, but, um, but the great thing about that is what it does is it deescalates immediately. I know that sounds weird and this is really uncomfortable sometimes to practice, but the more you practice it, the better you get at, at labeling um, somebody's either behavior or um, really the underlying emotion is what it is. So if they, if they attack with negativity, you know, they freak out or whatever, um, again, observe it without reaction, without judgment, and consciously in your head, label each negative feeling and replace it with a positive, compassionate, and solution-based thought. Um, and they may tell you something while they're freaking out uh, that you can use, but the point is, is labeling, um, again, is to discover the emotional state below the surface of their, their reactions. And a lot of the times, these words will pull it out. 
uh, sometimes they'll even tell you um, what what they're feeling if you can't figure it out. So um, again, labeling is is really key. It sounds like you're insecure about me operating this, or it, you know. So and then if they freak out, you're like, well, it just seems like that. I'm not saying it was that, but you can continue to mirror and label back and forth until you can kind of get down to the root cause. So after labeling, you may get a no. But again, like I mentioned in the beginning of the, the session that no is the beginning. So for good negotiators, no provides a great opportunity for you and the other party to clarify what you really want by eliminating what you don't want. So you're like, what does that even mean? So like this, for example, uh, no may mean I'm not yet ready to agree. Uh, you're making me feel uncomfortable. I don't understand. I don't think I can afford it. Uh, I want something else. I need more information. Uh, and a lot of the times this is where women get stuck because the, a lot of the times women don't ask and you, you must ask these things. Um, and also, um, when, when also when women are usually in negotiations, when they get that first no or that first pushback, they either tap out or they just concede and give everything. And so that's one of the things, and I won't go into too much into detail when it comes to negotiation uh, between men and women or women and women doesn't matter that women will do. So it's really important that when there's a no, you recognize that is not that it's a bad thing. It just means that there's something that the other party either isn't on board with, doesn't understand, needs reclarification, et cetera. Um, so if they say no, then something quick and easy that's solution-based, well, what about this doesn't work for you? What would you need to make it work? It seems like there's something here that bothers you. So again, you're prompting them to talk. Uh, you're doing an open-ended, what we call calibrated question, uh, where, where you're not getting a yes or no answer. If you're asking anything as like, uh, is this how this works? Yes, no. That's like the opposite of exactly what you ever wanna, wanna say. So if there's a no, what would work for you? What am I not understanding, uh, et cetera. So then they have to again, expand on that. So no is the beginning uh, and pushback is not bad. Also another way you gotta, you gotta learn how to uh, say no without saying no on your end. So for example, sometimes the only way if they're not helping you to understand what the real root cause of their issue is, the only way to get them to listen and engage with you is by forcing them into a no. So like this, that means intentionally, be, like, like saying something absurd. That means intentionally mis mislabeling one of their emotions or desires as a ridiculous question. Like, it seems like you want this project to fail. Have you given up on this project? Like, so these are examples of something where you, you already know the other party has not just given up and they're not throwing up the white flag. But um, if you were to ridiculously label this as that, then they immediately come back because they realize that pe people have loss aversion. They, they don't want to lose. Um, and so then they go, oh crap, I actually have like the whole project to lose or the project to fail, et cetera. So uh, you just want to use this to check in with them and kind of bring them back to where you wanted them to expand on the no and explain to you exactly where in this process, uh, what, what the no is for, you know, what exactly they mean. Um, another way uh, to, to do this is to use trick, these two trigger words, um, or you want to trigger these two words immediately, they will transform your negotiation. So we're going to kind of go into, if you're using these strategies and your other party is just ridiculous and they're stonewalling you and you can't get past things and they're just like, you know, they'll, they'll do what I'm telling you to do to, to you where they're like, I'm going to go to the bathroom, I'm going to get something to eat, I'm going to give you the weekend, I'm going to do all this stuff and you now can control the situation. So what you want to do is you want to ask something that will get a, a reaction or response from the other party and they'll say, that's right. So before you convince your counterpart to see what you're trying to accomplish, you have to say the things to them that will get them to say that's right. So that's right is better than a yes, strive for it. Reaching that's right in negotiation creates breakthroughs. So for example, again, if you're mirroring and you're repeating something that they said and you're asking for clarification, so you want this? is that right? And then usually they'll say is like, that's right. So if you say it first, they'll mirror you back. And then if they don't mirror you back, that's another sign that you have to kind of come back to that no place to get them to say a no. Uh, so you kind of have to sometimes go back and forth um, mirroring and labeling. So then you would go into a label where, you know, you're back to not understanding, like if it wasn't a that's right, then you go back to uh, labeling. Well, it seems like this, and then you're calling out the emotion. So again, back and forth until you get them to get them to get it out uh, what they really want. Now, now when it's your turn to talk, um, there's a few things that are that are really helpful 
for you. Again, if you are um, in this back and forth process and they're really not getting anywhere and you kind of need to <sighs> take a break and, and, and use some other tactics to kind of get some more out of the other party, um, first thing, they're actually swapped. Second thing, but first thing, honestly, is if you can get the other person to go first, most of the time, that's really key. Um, because going first is not necessarily the best thing when it comes to negotiating price. Again, if you can get the other side to, like if it's a monetary negotiation, get them to say it first, um, then you can come up with other solutions later. So non-monetary concessions, kind of how to haggle between, oh, oh, this was my price and you're like way off. And then, so you can use things to haggle in between. But if you have to say it first, uh, you may have to use some like really ridiculous anchor um, and, and put some ridiculous figure. Um, again, you have to prepare yourself physically, uh, I mean, psychologically, or well, it's supposed to say psychologically to withstand the offer. So if, if you say something first uh, and the guy's a pro or a shark, he's going to use an extreme anchor uh, to bend your reality. You want to do that to them. So um, you don't want to go first on price because then they would just shut down and say no. So you want them to, to give a price first. Uh, and sometimes you might be surprised that you might get a better price than you even were looking for. Um, but anyway, so and anchoring your emotions, um, these are key things to try, you know, on the other party. Again, bend your counterpart's reality. Um, you have to start with basics of empathy. Start out with an accusation audit, acknowledging all of the fears. So for example, if someone is accusing you of something, like someone is telling you that you're a liar or you stole or something like that, um, saying that out loud, again, it's a label, but saying that out loud to, you know, you think that I'm a crook or you think that, or I'm seeing that you think this, um, or you try not to use I or you actually. So I am picking up that I am perceived as a thief. Um, and so what you're doing is you kind of look at their emotions and you see like what end of the spectrum um, for, to, to audit their, uh, their fears, or if, if there is something you're picking up on their end and why accusing you of that would scare them is because sometimes you have to talk about a past situation. There's so many examples, but you want to basically do a check-in with an audit acknowledging their fears. Um, and then again, with monetary negotiations, you want to let them go first. Surprise with a gift. This is, oh, sorry, with numbers, uh, this is interesting. Oh, I, I went forward, sorry. Establish a range. So for example, I say this all the time. So for example, um, I, I use like the next couple of uh, tactics constantly in any kind of price negotiation, uh, any real estate, in single home, retail sales, in whatever. So establishing a range. For example, if somebody is uh, wanting you, say as an agent, to, to give, give them what your commission is going to be or, um, you know, et cetera. So what I actually do is I say, well, the industry standard is this. And so I fall here. So if you, if you use an industry standard or phrase it as an industry standard, that actually provides a frame of reference for the other person and establishes a range. So then they're more likely to stay within that range versus you know, having some extreme anchor where they just pick a, a way bottom price that it makes no sense. Um, so I say that all the time. I will put like a, a range or a reference, um, establish a ballpark. Um, in, in, so the ballpark, um, instead of saying I'm worth $110,000, uh, at top places like X Corporation, people at this job are earning between one hundred and thirty and one hundred seventy thousand dollars. They get your point across without moving the party into a uh, defensive position where they're like, you know, that's ridiculous. So again, you're putting it on some somebody else, some other standard uh, off you. Uh, pivoting to a non-monetary term, trades of an equal value is where I'm like super strong, I think. So when it comes to trying to figure out what the other party wants, maybe you know they. Um, they have a lot of, uh, in, on multifamily, a lot of deferred maintenance on their property, a lot of problems with, uh, with the tenants, a lot of whatever. And you could offer up, instead of a monetary value, uh, you could offer something else up, you know, where it's like, okay, well, what we'll do is my team will take care of these issues. And so then you no longer have to worry about that problem. And so from there forward, uh, you know, the other party is happy. So it could be, Things like, you know, they, they want earnest, uh, hard earnest money. And, you know, instead of doing that, you know, you want an early access agreement uh, to let your contractors come in and see. Um, and so I would trade uh, days uh, for us to go look for money or different things like that. So you can trade unequal value. And if you have a skill set, I do that all the time where I'm like, okay, so you're a good ghostwriter and um, I can give you leads over here or whatever. There's so many different things. I won't go too far into it. 
Um, five, another great thing to turn uh, the conversation if you can't uh, is to, when you're talking numbers, use odd ones. This is really weird with the psychology and I know it sounds weird, but um, numbers that ends in zero inevitably feel like a temporary placeholder. Guesstimates that you can easily neg be negotiated out of. Anything you throw out that sounds less round, say 37,263, feels like a figure that you came up with a result of thoughtful calculation. So for me, like I had a property recently that was like 4.4 million. And instead of offering 4.4 million, I offered 4.375, 4 I think is what I did. Um, and I mean, I wouldn't even do the sense um, because that's uh, that's petty. But anyway, it's, it just shows the other party that usually they believe that there's it's like in your due diligence, that there's some calculation that you came up with that, you know, exactly spot on what you need to pay for the property. Um, and again, this is just a mind, 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 mind trick. Um, a surprise with a gift. This is so opposite of what everybody else tries to do. You can really get your counterpart into a mood of generosity by doing it staking an extreme anchor, like I want to be this much below your price or they're not below, but I want to be at this price, which is way below. And then after their inevitable first rejection, offering them something unrelated as a surprise gift. You're like, what, what do I give them as a gift? I mean, like literally in this negotiation, I'm, I'm going to have to get into at the end of the month, I'm going to give this other party this book. That's, that's mine. Um, and there's other things that you could ask, or if you want to figure it out, what does it take to be successful here? Um, and they'll tell you what they want. So again, there's non-monetary trades of value. You could say, okay, well, I will do this, or I'll assign you this, or I'll give you that um, as a gift uh, for us to move forward. Uh, the F word, that is something that is warning sign. Um, it's an emotional term. So F word fair is what I'm talking about. Um, people usually exploit it to the other side uh, and then they basically become defensive. You know, if you're, if you're saying, you know, this isn't fair or whatever, they're using it as an emotional tactic to gain concessions. Uh, when they, your counterpart drops, drops the F-bomb, don't get suckered into the concession. Instead, ask them to explain how you're mistreating them. This is so funny because then they think, well, you know, I didn't mean it that way, or, you know, it'll actually make that fair word completely go away. And so instead of it being like an equal fair thing, then, then unequal trades of value and unequal scales will come back into play. Um, you can bend your counterpart's reality by anchoring his starting point. Um, so again, before offering anything, making an offer, mostly anchor them by saying how bad it will be. I do this all the time. So for example, if I'm putting forward an offer to a broker uh, and I know that I'm going to be offering them way below what the seller would ever accept and I want to preface, you know, that I may ruin their relationship with the seller, I'll say, you know, this is probably going to be the lowest offer you guys are going to get, especially if they're pushing me to give them an offer. That's the other thing is if your other party is pushing you to, to, to give you an offer, you're like, okay, you know, I'm an asshole, but this is what I'm going to do. Or, um, you know, this is going to be the worst offer you've ever seen, but I'll do this. So if you're, if you're anchoring it, they actually never get angry. And sometimes it's actually worked, which is cool. And then sometimes they'll start negotiating from there, which is awesome because that's what you want is to be way below. Um, but yeah, setting a, an extreme anchor to uh, make your offer feel, make your, make your real offer seem reasonable uh, to use a range seems less aggressive. So Again, um, using um, anchoring as a starting point is great. All right, uh, after your turn to talk, um, remember how I mentioned earlier calibrated open-ended questions. So this is a great way uh, to make your counterpart feel like they're in charge, but they're not. You are the one in charge. So you're going to have to repeat calibrated questions usually four times before saying no. Uh, it's not always, sometimes it's three. Um, but even with the best techniques and strategy, you need to regulate your emotions if you want any type of coming out on top. So bite your tongue. Um, so a simple rule is when you're verbally assaulted, disarm your counterpart by asking a calibrated question. So if they freak out and they're like, this is ridiculous, I'm not doing this, da 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 da, and, and you want to like help them to diffuse the situation, the best examples um, are, what about this is important to you? How can I help this? How can I help make this better for us? How would you like me to proceed? What is it that brought us into this situation? How can we solve this problem? What is the objective? I ask that one all the time. What do you, what do we really want here? Um, 
what are we trying to accomplish here exactly? How am I supposed to do that? That's another one that's really uncomfortable, but that works all the freaking time, especially in email. And it's really funny because you'll have someone like, uh, you have negotiated commissions and all kinds of stuff in the past where they'll give you something super low and you're used to three times that amount. And um, I will literally in their email uh, or in my response, I'll say, this, this is what we've done in the past. This is the industry average. Um, and then uh, I, appreciate your offer. It's another thing we'll cover in a sec. Um, you appreciate the offer. Your offer was very generous. I appreciate that, but I don't know how I'm supposed to do that. And you see how that was super smooth and it wasn't that crazy. But if you just say like a one line of response in an email, how am I supposed to do that? I would not do that. But using open-ended questions, um, especially how am I supposed to do that? The other party immediately knows that this isn't a no from you, but it basically makes them talk. So they have to, you know, explain everything or the usually they will, not always. Sometimes people are, you know, um, really good on the other side. Um, here's another way um, to say no without a no. Like I mentioned, your offer is very generous. I'm sorry, that just doesn't work for me. Is again, an elegant way to say no, uh, or I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I just can't do that. Or again, like I mentioned earlier, depending on where you're at, if you're haggling, um, you can use, we don't do that. Um, so again, you're not saying no, uh, because the word no usually freaks out the other party. I want to know from the other party for me to hear to go, oh, that means to get started now. But, you know, if you uh, elicit a no on, or if you say a no, they, they usually freak out. So you want to say no without saying no. Uh, so again, if they're still difficult and you're still not getting anywhere, then you got to haggle, a good old school haggle. This is kind of where we're all uh, familiar with negotiating and all of us think that this is how it typically works. But here's here's a little, so again, they're going to force you into having to haggle. Um, so again, you want to detour the, the conversation to the non-monetary issues first. So um, let's put the price off to the side for a moment and talk about what what would make this a good deal? So if you can kind of start working on things that they need as a concession, maybe it's like an insurance claim, maybe it is, you know, that they want uh, to make sure that you can close. And so, you know, this would work instead, or, you know, they want less days here and due diligence, whatever it is, non-monetary things that you can say that would make it a good deal for them. Uh, and then again, if they force you to talk about price, uh, they, they push you to go, uh, go, for, or go first, sorry. Uh, instead of naming a price, allude to an incredibly high number that someone else might charge. Again, put it on somebody else. This is freaking genius and it works because you're creating that frame for them. If they're like, give me a price, give me, just give me a freaking price. Um, what you would say is, um, why would you, why would you ever do business with me? Why, why would you ever change from your existing supplier? They're great. Uh, that's an incidence if you're a rep, for example. Um, and then uh, basically setting, oh, I'm not going to get in that for a second. Sorry. Um, so whenever you're talking to your, uh, oh yeah, so again, sorry, putting it on someone else, you're saying um, they force you to name your price, tell me your price, and you go, well, you know, I wouldn't charge as much as Joe, he just charged $10 million for this, and that doesn't even make sense. So so you're essentially, in their mind, you're placing $10 million as a starting place. It's, it's crazy what it does to your psychology, but it freaking works. Uh, so they see that 10, and they go, Okay, we're going to be somewhere below that 10, but it could be $9,999,000. You know what I mean? Really, it could be. So again, uh, when you're in this place where they're forcing you to uh, list a price or name a price, uh, and, and you, again, it's from a competitor, uh, you're going to put a frame of reference. Why would you ever do business with me? Why would you ever charge or change from your pre-existing supplier? They're great. Um, and then uh, the why coaxes your counterpart to work for you. Because uh, again, they have to explain, they have to expand, they have to kind of give up all of their chips, if you will. Um, and so here's a great way when you're going into a negotiation before you ever even sit down with that person um, to, or if you're on a Zoom call or whatever, if you get that in, in person or even a call, actually, um, if you can kind of do your research and figure out, again, normative uh, to your um, environment, to your industry, to your market, to all the things that you're negotiating, or even like if you're in a divorce negotiation, what's normal in a divorce negotiation? I mean, this stuff works for everything. Um, figuring out how to set your goal or your target. So in this situation, it's, it's a monetary goal, setting your target price. So the strategy here is you set your price, your goal. And I think this is where everyone's pretty familiar with this haggling, but this, this works really well. So first you set your, your first offer at 65% of your target price. So you calculate three raises 
lasting increments, 85, 95, 100 percent. Um, then use lots of empathy in different ways of saying no to get the other side to counter before you increase your offer. Uh, so when calculating the final amount, use precise non-round numbers, like you mentioned earlier, no zeros, 37,893 rather than you know $38,000. It gives the number credibility and weight. Uh, and then on your final number, throw in a non-monetary item that they, they probably don't want just to show you're at your limit. So I know that sounds stupid, but it actually it actually works. Um, you know, I'll, and I'll even throw in the chiller and it's not something they even want, but then that's again, like, especially how I just said it, that's the way for them to go. Oh, that's their ceiling. Okay. Um, but anyway, like I mentioned earlier, so you're, you're setting your, your, for your target price of a hundred percent. Uh, and then basically your raises of increasing value, or if you're on the opposite end, um, you know, starting 60, yeah. So you're starting at 65% of your target price. And then you'll go for it to 85%, 95%, 100%. So knowing what the market will bear, what the industry will do, what's normal, what's expected, and then going from there, uh, this really works. Now, in commercial real estate, in apartments where it's been very competitive, this doesn't really work, unfortunately, right now. Now, as we get into a more of a buyer's market and things switch a little bit, this is going to be a great way, uh, like even, even kind of COVID prices right now, um, where you could make an offer and if you're like the only buyer, you know, but when you're going up against multiple, multiple people, this doesn't really work um, because basically you're not going to beat other people's offers. So, but this is really great when it's you and one other person, uh, the haggle, um, and you're still not getting any movement. You're like, damn, they, they still, sorry for the words, but they, they still won't budge. They still won't give me anything back, any feedback, any what they're real, what they really want. Then you need to find the black swan. This is the last thing. And so this is, uh, something great from Chris Voss, if you ever read Never Split the Difference. Um, so what you want to do is you want to be aware at any given moment um, that you want your other side at any given moment to feel like they could lose the negotiation and it could collapse. So to get leverage, you want to uh, persuade your counterpart that they have something real to lose if this falls through. Um, so for example, if uh, if you were doing a deal with somebody, maybe you're negotiating with your future partner on something and maybe they put in a lot of earnest money or maybe they, the reputation is on the line or maybe, you know, whatever it is. Um, that's something that you would bring up uh, again as the black swan to persuade your counterpart that they have something real to lose in this deal. Now you can use positive leverage and normative leverage uh, to do this. So positive leverage is quite simply your ability to, uh, as a negotiator to provide or withhold things that your counterpart wants. When they say that you have power uh, or normative leverage again is using the other party's norms and standards to advance your position. If you can show inconsistencies between their beliefs and, the, and, uh, and their actions, you have normative leverage because it kind of makes the other person think, oh, okay, so I'm acting this way, but my actual standards are this. And so that makes them, makes them change um, their position, usually makes them back down. But again, if they feel like they have something real to lose, if this deal falls through, um, then, then they will concede. So finding that black swan is, is super key. Um, execution, so this is like the final, final thing. When you finally get the other party to start agreeing with you and moving forward and you guys have negotiated basically what you're gonna end up with, this is something that is super important. You have to get confirmation to guarantee that they will hold up their side of the deal. And some people that are jerks still maybe won't, but this usually, like I'd say 99% of the time it works. So there are two key questions that you want to ask to push your counterparts to think they are defining success in their way. Again, make it think, make them think it's their idea. Um, how will we know that we're on track is one question. So then they're going to out loud define exactly what that looks like. Um, and if there's inconsistencies, then again, you have to change, you have to have another conversation. Uh, the second question is, how will we address things if we're off track? So again, they will answer and then you will summarize their answers until you get it, that's right. And that's when you know that they have bought in. So basically you're getting them to verbally out loud repeat what you guys have come down to and then get them to say, like you'll repeat, so I see this and this and this, is that right? And then they'll say that's right. And then until you get that, that's right. Um, if, if they say, I'll try, for example, that means I plan to fail. It does every time. Uh, and when you hear either of the above, you got to dive back in with those calibrated how questions. Again, you never want to ask, um, but you want to always ask how. Uh, or why uh, questions until they define the terms of a successful implementation in their own voice. So they out loud 
will tell you what a successful implementation works and you keep asking how or why, well, but more, like ha more how uh, to get them to con continue trying, which is funny because you're basically giving, giving them again another soft no and telling them this isn't good or doesn't work for you without saying anything negative. You're not saying no, absolutely not. This doesn't work for me. You know, you're just saying how, how, and they explain. Anyway, so once they summarize, uh, you'll get a, a that's right. Uh, and then the rule of three is simply getting to the other guy to agree to the same thing three times in a conversation. It may not always take three times. Maybe they're so excited about the solution that they didn't think of that they're, you know, you can just tell that they're emotionally in, but usually having them say it throughout the negotiation three different times will guarantee that you have execution of whatever the agreement has been. Um, now, I'm not going to go through this. I'm going to leave this here. So if you want this for uh, extra credit later on and come back, this is a, a great way um, to negotiate a better salary in a job. And again, this is something specifically that applies to women because we don't ask. Um, but this is basically a ways to negotiate a salary with, with your superior. So I'll leave this in here. If y'all want the presentation, it will still be in here. Uh, and that is the end of my presentation today on how to successfully negotiate in real estate. Um, who is interested in being qualified for our next multifamily investment? Um, if you want to drop your name in the chat um, or answer this quick poll, then you can be qualified for our next multifamily investment. And I will get a list of everybody who clicked on this uh, for our next, I mean, clicked on this um, and I'll be able to follow up with you after, after we're done. Um, so I'll give y'all another couple of seconds. I think I have one more slide that I wanted to mention before we go into Real Estate IQ's um, explanation of all the awesome services that they have um, and how they can help you get started today. So, oh, actually, I, it's out. It's not in there. It's, Just kidding. It's later. Oh, oh, okay. It's later. So I guess that'll pop up later. But for now, I'll stop sharing and then what, what you'll see is basically that they're in July, at the end of July, there is a, I think it's called Apartment Investing uh, Summit that myself and a whole bunch of in other individuals will be uh, involved with. And it's just the link um, to get a discount to, to get in. Um, and I, it's, I'm sad that this is the last out of our seven weeks here with Real Estate IQ. They have been so supportive of me and us. Um, but if you're interested in continuing to learn about apartment investing, especially investing, especially if you want to be active as a sponsor, uh, at that event, we'll actually have a shark tank uh, where people that have deals can get in front of the sponsors that are uh, sponsoring the event and present their deal and either partner or, or we can buy it from them or we can partner on money or whatever. So uh, I'll let Becky go uh, ahead. All right. Thank you, Kaylee. That's really great information. I actually am not quite yet done, but almost with the Never Split the Difference book on my Audible account. And so it's great. It's a great summary and a great review of a lot of those really good terms. So thank you for that. All right. This event's brought to you by Real Estate IQ. We have over 45,000 leads every month. And so our guarantee, you can always find a deal with Real Estate IQ. So the first thing I want to do is show you our community. And so um, if you go to our website, which is realestateiq.co and click here on community and go to groups. We uh, have a lot of different groups. This is gonna be kind of a social media site for investors, kind of a Facebook for investors. And so we have all these groups where you can connect with people. And Kaylee has a group, I just typed in apartment. Here it is, Apartment Real Estate Investors. And so this is where you'll be able to go after we're done and get a video of this deal, of Kaylee's presentation today. Um, so, and it's also a place where you can go and ask questions and uh, meet other apartment investors and all that good stuff. So also here, our marketplace is a place where you can connect with vendors that you might need for your business. Uh, education, if you're looking for a mentor, funding, vendors here is like uh, title companies, contractors, whatever, other kind of things you might need for your business. And also if you're, do, if you're interested in passive investing in notes, uh, you can find vendors there who can help you out. Um, you can go to events and see our upcoming webinars and events. Tools is where you can find our products. And I want to highlight 
ROI Muse right now. This is a, uh, and a really good deal analysis calculator for investors. And uh, ROI Muse is a company that we partnered with to bring this to you. And so there's residential deal analysis for a single family and multifamily commercial deal analysis. So all that good stuff. So make sure you check that out. Um, and then, let's, so our deal analysis suite lets you run comps. Uh, this is for single family predominantly, um, but also you can comp a vacant lot, for example, or a small multifamily property. And we have all of these off-market leads. And so these are distressed and motivated sellers that might have a reason to sell you their property. And we also have commercial leads for a bunch of these, which is anything owned by a commercial entity. So all kinds of uh, motivated sellers, our premium list, the ones that have the little stars by them come with skip tracing already done. So it'll have email addresses and phone numbers for the owners so you can contact them. Uh, our county data finder lets you search the tax records for whatever kind of property you're looking for. Uh, so if you're looking for a commercial, single family, multifamily, mobile homes, any of those, you can search for absentee owners. You can search uh, all the small multifamily properties in a certain neighborhood, for example, if, if you want to start with a small one, whatever you're looking for. So you can create a really targeted list for to market to. So our deal finding suite includes the off market leads, the county data finder, and also our MLS deal finder, which is going to catch discounted properties that meet your criteria. You can set it up so when a new property comes on the market or has a price change, you get an email about it right away and get notified. So a lot of ways to help you find and then and analyze. There's that ROI news to analyze your deals. Um, so we have a good customer service team that's always ready to help you out. We have tutorial videos, all that good stuff. So that once you get started, uh, we make sure you can be successful. All right, we also have some freebies. These are some heat maps that kind of tell you where the deals are, depending on what kind of deal you're looking for. But we also have our deal of the day, which is a live single family deal off the MLS that's at a discount. And we analyze it with our system and blast it out. So you could make an offer on it, or you could, it's also a good uh, educational tool just to kind of know what's on the market, what's available, as well as some things you want to think about to analyze it. So if you're interested in any of those, just check the little button on the poll. And remember, if you answer these poll questions, you'll get entered uh, into that drawing to win some free service. Uh, if you missed Asking for the one-on-one -on -one deal finding training and you're interested in that free 45-minute uh, demo, please put that in the chat. And here is Kaylee's contact information. And at this time, we'll open it up to questions and answers. Oh, I, I did put up the Q&A. I was like, where did I put that slide? It's, out, it's right after this, I think. Okay, okay. <laughs> or is it after the Q&A? Yes. Oh, yeah, it looks like crap. Okay, sorry. We'll go back to the Q&A. Yeah, if y'all want that, um, if you'll comment in the, um, in the real estate investors group, um, I'd be happy to get you <laughs> the link there too, because you can't click on this one, obviously. Uh, but this is the apartment investing secret. So we'll cover uh, 10 secrets that you're not ever going to find any other way, but by being at this conference. So it's real life examples of things that have happened. Uh, and someone in, uh, asked a question actually about that earlier. Um, did you say you would share your slides? Uh, yes, I will. And if you will click on that group in the chat, y'all, uh, that's the best place to go and, and we'll post the video in there. So again, that will go through the slides. And if you want the actual slides, just uh, I think you have to do at you know, me or at Kaylee or whatever, and I can, I'll see that and I'll send it to you, no problem. Um, and then also the summit, is it in Houston or Dallas? It's worldwide. It's, it's, it's virtual. <laughs> so, uh, so you can be wherever you want to be, you can be Mexico. I don't care. Um, but the cool thing about it. So how we do is like, you know, how the cool thing about a, um, summit is that you have people that you meet, right? 
So what we have is we structured uh, some speeches and it's there's different rooms that you can be like virtual rooms you can be in. Um, you can pick anyone you want. There's multiple of us all at the same time for three days. And then for lunch, there's a legends lunch. Again, different speakers and you can be in either any room that you want to be in. Um, and then uh, for the uh, shark tank, well, there's actually a breakout session right after legends. Uh, where we have these breakout rooms that depending on what topic that you liked, we can break out and then have um, basically smaller uh, places to have conversations like this. And then the, the Shark Tank deal is just something hopefully that's, that's like TV, you know, um, but we'll also have people on there. So if you're interesting or interested also, if you have like multifamily deals that you want to get sponsored or you want to partner, that's another great place to use it. But it's, yeah, it's, it's online. It's anywhere you are. <laughs> Um, let's see, any other questions? Um, is there any big difference on negotiating single family versus multi? Yeah, you know, like I mentioned earlier, um, whenever you're negotiating a single family contract, typically um, it is via a TREC promulgated form. So a TREC promulgated form basically is like a legal template that, and that attorneys have put together with most of the verbiage and things that are pretty standard, you know, as far as like there being an option period, as far as there being earnest money, as far as there being whatever. But when you're negotiating a commercial contract, whatever you put in your offer slash contract, I mean, you can put anything in there. So you can negotiate anything you want. You can negotiate for, uh, like, for example, like option money isn't a thing. Like there's no option money in multifamily. It's just earnest. And you can negotiate hard earnest. You can keep it soft. You can do early access agreement, like I mentioned earlier, where I'll do like, like say, say it's 75,000 hard, hard money day one. And you're like, okay, well, I'm going to give you 25K day one. And you're going to give me 10 days of, early access in exchange for that. And then once it meets our standards, then we'll give you the remaining 50 after that. Or even I just learned freaking yesterday from somebody else, that's why you hire commercial brokers to help you with this stuff, um, is that you know being creative, like for example, Robin goes, you know, you can actually do hard money, but you can offer the hard money after you do your inspections. It just has to be a shorter inspection for them to do that. And I'm like, oh, you know, so, so you're doing hard money because don't let it scare you. There's a creative way to do everything. Um, and even like, for example, for me, I had some properties that I bought with crappy roofs, you know, and again, a non-monetary way to make everybody happy because the seller was not going to give me 150 K haircut off the price uh, for the roof, but the roof was crap and needed to be replaced. So there was a way that we worked out where he would make a claim on his insurance and then name me or my company as beneficiary. Then we had to go back to uh, an attorney and write off a set, uh, write out a, se a separate uh, addendum, which is again, we just, we created it. That's why you have attorneys. Uh, to where there would be zero liability to him, his company, any affiliates, et cetera. If, for example, I committed, um, I committed uh, insurance fraud afterwards, because he always has to worry about like the liability aspect of stuff. So yeah, so I mean, as far as negotiating, you know, single family, it's pretty, pretty standard. And I mean, like I've heard some weird stuff in single family, like, can I have your goat? you know, or whatever, but like, but not, you know, as far as you're going to say, no, I'm going to change the way the contract is written and the way that this works. There's no earnest. I mean, there's no option. I mean, you can do whatever you want. So that's, I would say that's, that's the big difference is as creative as you are is the kind of deal that you're going to get. Um, let's see. Okay. Apart from another question and y'all, if you have any more, please uh, give us some questions so I can answer. Apart from offering to close sooner, what other non-monetary concessions can we, I mean, like anything, like literally, like I mentioned about the, so what would have happened that insurance uh, instance was that instead of the seller paying 150K to fix the roof and doing a price haircut, or then giving me that like after, uh, like basically as a credit or them doing it, them fixing it before closing or any of that kind of stuff, uh, the creative way that I handled that was basically making the insurance pay for it. But I had to make sure that as far as, you know, putting me in his contract and assigning our company and, and this kind of stuff that, that that was handled. And so that didn't cost him a dime. You know what I mean? And actually what I did, cause he pushed back at first on that, uh, with the liability thing, I was like, well, we'll just form some legal contracts that cover your butt, you know, no big deal. But in addition to that, what I'll do for you is that if there's excess funds. So for example, all I needed was the roof. What happens when you do a hail, a wind hail claim, um, single multi doesn't matter, but, but especially multi is that it's, it's a large, it's a large amount of money usually to replace. And the wind hail is uh, applicable to the, um, the roof, the siding, um, the um, AC units, uh, the fencing, uh, the paint, 
um, like all of the exterior stuff that the hail could affect. Um, and so maybe the hail wasn't that bad where I felt the need to repaint the entire complex. So if there was excess money on top of what we would need to fix the roof or replace the roof, then I would just actually write a check for him for the difference. So that was like an additional thing that I offered. And I mean, there's so many things non-monetary. So the biggest things that in, in commercial that sellers want um, is they want to make sure you can close. They want to make sure they're going to get paid. Um, and so anything that you can do to make them feel like they're getting um, something. So for example, this is something I was told, which is BS, because they're like, oh, you're young and you're new. But luckily, I've got older people in my life that like negotiate really well. And, uh, you know, we had a, a period of time where in due diligence, they didn't give us all the information that was requested. When you write up a purchase and sale agreement, you, you put all the reports that you're requesting, all of them, like all the, uh, all the facts, uh, all the uh, material facts. So, um, and if they don't give them to you and you're out of this happened to me, you're out of now your uh, due diligence period. Like that's not something that's, that's my fault. You know what I mean? That was them not giving that. So, um, basically a legal entity, whether it's their side, my side, whatever, they would say, okay, well, you're not acting, um, in good faith. And so therefore the other party can leave and, and get their earnest money back, or you can, you know, negotiate something. So I told them that I knew that. So they go, oh, well, your, your earnest is already hard. You're already past that period now and you didn't finish. And I'm like, look, brother, like you didn't give me all the information that we needed. So what we're going to do, and because he's telling me that my, my money is hard in an escrow account. And I'm like, no, it's not. There are three reasons why escrow or uh, earnest money is released. And it's either the fact that a legal and like you are not acting. One of us is not acting in good, good, what did I say, good faith. So it's a good faith deposit. So they would release that. Um, or I sign off or we close. Those are the only three ways that you're going to get that money. So in, a, in an attempt to get what I needed and also get some more time because it was their fault, um, I said, what I'm going to do is I will release, so make it hard, I will release X amount of dollars from that, that earnest, I mean, the, the escrow account or earnest account, whatever, earnest money uh, to you. So, you, you know, I'll give you $5,000. I'll give you $10,000 of the money that's already sitting there for us to continue forward because at this point I can walk away too and get hundred percent of my money back. Cause he was telling me that it was hard. And I'm like, no, it's not uh, because you're not acting in good faith. You didn't deliver all the uh, items that you agreed to in the contract. So um, that's something uh, other concessions, as far as like, you know, what here's some huge lessons in your contract um, to not start, like you put, don't start due diligence days that you've negotiated until all those material facts have been delivered. So then they need to hurry their butt up and get all that stuff to you within probably like a week. Uh, all the reports, otherwise they'll drag on and take their time and then make excuses later. And then technically then you are for 30 days, 45 days, whatever it is that is your due diligence does not start officially until that. So what you could actually do is you'd have a little bit of time to have like a free look, like, like free early access agreement without having to put any money down uh, or any hard money down. So um, there's all kinds of d different ways to, it's just as creative as you are is, is how you can get a multifamily deal done. Um, yeah. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? And I'm still learning every day. I still learn all kinds of stuff. Well, if you have any other questions, you've got my contact information there, admin at theapartmentqueen.com. Uh, check me out on Instagram at theapartmentqueen underscore. Um, or again, right in the chat, you have the link for our apartment real estate investors group where you can go back to all the other weeks if you've missed any content. Uh, if you want to view any of those slides, I have all the, the slide decks that I've created for every week. Either they're in there or you know, if you want them, um, I'm happy to give them to you. But yeah, if you just put at, kind of like when you're tagging someone on LinkedIn or whatever, uh, at Kaylee McMahon or at the apartment queen or whatever I'm in there as, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions and give you any, any materials that are helpful. All right, awesome. Thank you, Kaylee. Yeah. It's been, this was awesome. I learned a lot just from me sitting in on these over the time. So uh, those of you, if you did miss some of those, do, do go to the community, join Kaylee's group, check out the past, the past presentations because she's got some really good information for you. Absolutely. And I'm happy to answer any other questions that maybe I didn't cover too. So y'all just reach out. No problem. All right. And we'll look forward to seeing you at that summit. Thank you, Becky.
All right, have a great day, everyone.